if instead of giving the string just a shake um, to, to send one wave pulse down it, um, if we, instead we give it repetitive periodic shakes, then we would get periodic wave pulses, or periodic motion, or a periodic wave. So, one way that we can accomplish that more precisely is to hook it up to a simple harmonic oscillator that we're familiar with of a mass on a spring. So if we took this system, which we studied heavily last chapter, and we put a little anchor fix point on it, and we attached a string to it, and move, allowed the system to move up and down, then we would get a periodic wave. Um, and what this means is that it has symmetrical, a symmetric sequence of crests and troughs, or a regular sequence. And so this would be a crest here, same here and here. And troughs down here. So the waves would be traveling this way, and the displacement is up and down, and we can talk about the displacement having some amplitude, usually denoted A, and the wave has a wavelength from peak to peak or trough to trough has some wavelength lambda wavelength so the wave that's produced if this is truly a simple harmonic oscillator is sinusoidal and it turns out that any periodic wave can actually be represented as a combination of sinusoidal waves. So that's actually a whole field, decomposing waves composed of many frequencies into their constitutive combinations of simple sine waves. That is the key task in signal processing. So um, thinking back to the individual particles in the medium that are moving, when a sinusoidal wave passes through the medium, every single particle is set into simple harmonic motion with frequency f. So each particle that you consider is moving up and down with frequency f, according to simple harmonic motion. So essentially, every particle on the string becomes a simple harmonic oscillator. The distance from one crest to the next, as we said, or one trough to the next, is the wavelength. And the wave progresses with wave speed nu, this guy, through one wavelength, so one lambda, in a time span of one period, which is usually denoted t, so, uh, period is t. So if we were to draw up a relationship between those quantities, you'd say the wave speed is equal to one, a distance of one wavelength per period. Or, since period is the inverse of frequency, we can say lambda f. So this is uh, like cycles per second would be the units. And the units of frequency are, um, or the inverse. Uh, seconds per cycle. There we go. The units of frequency are, uh, you could say, cycles per second. So they're inverses of each other. So before we move into a further mathematical description, here's an example uh, of, of, well, maybe not example. Here's an opportunity to point out um, how waves can easily get more complex. So we're talking about one-dimensional waves here. They don't need to be one-dimensional. They don't need to be two-dimensional. Um, 
All of these same concepts and quantities apply to waves of two or three or even higher in a more abstract mathematical sense, waves, uh, dimension waves. So um, one physical example is drops of a liquid falling onto a still liquid surface. Um, so these produce, if you ever dropped a, a rock into a lake or something, um, these produce waves that propagate radially outward Right. It's a disturbance that propagates radially away from the original disturbance uh, from, from the drop, and this would be a two-dimensional example. So always be thinking about how this can get uh, more complex, and this is just one um, vehicle that we're using to describe these things. All right, so next we're going to get into a mathematical description of a wave and that will be getting to the meat of it.